In the previous video, I said that fields of force and fluid flows would be my primary motivating examples for vector fields. Let me start by talking about these two fields. If I have a field of force, it acts on objects in it. Gravitational force acts on objects with mass. mass. Electromagnetic force acts on an object with charge. A natural question is, if I put an object in a field, what will it do? How will the force act upon it? Presumably, the object will move due to the force. How will it move? What path will it take? I can ask a similar question about fluid flow. If I put a buoyant object, not affected by other forces such as gravity, into a fluid, what will happen with it? Presumably, it will move with the movement of the fluid. But what path will it take? In both of these contexts, I end up asking about a path. And a path is a parametric curve. So, to answer this question, there should be a connection between vector fields and parametric curves. Let me define this connection. Say I have a vector field F defined on the domain S in Rn, and say I have a parametric curve with outputs in the region S. Then the curve gamma is called an integral curve of the vector field if the tangents of the curve are the same as the vector field evaluated along the curve. What does this mean? Well, the tangents are the direction of motion of the curve. At an instant in time, the tangent points in the direction of the path, with its length measuring the speed. By saying that the tangent is the same as the vector field, this means that the vector field describes all the directions and speeds of the path. The integral curves are those that match the movement described by the field. They solve the question I started with. If an object sits within a field that can act upon it, then it will be accelerated to move upon these paths. There is a subtlety here about the object's starting velocity and how it interacts with the field, but I'll leave that aside for now. Here is a vector field in R2 given by f of xy equals negative y times or negative y and then x. I can think of this field as describing motion, but what motion does it describe? Well, it looks a lot like moving around in circles. Here are some integral curves, which are indeed circles. And you can check that the tangents to these curves at any point match up with the direction of the field, which is the definition of an integral curve. Objects that this field can act upon will be pulled into these circle paths. These paths represent what the field wants to do to objects that live inside it. You may remember from parametric curves the pattern of a circle. A circle of radius a as a parametric curve has x-coordinate a cos t and y-coordinate a sine t. The tangent to the curve is the derivative of each component, so here negative a sine t and a cos t. These are the directions of movement of the curve. The field in the previous two diagrams was f of xy equals negative yx. If I evaluate the field along the curve, that means I replace the x and y coordinates with the x and y coordinates of the curve. So negative y becomes negative a sine t, and x, of course, is replaced with a cos t. Now compare. The derivative of the curve and the field evaluated along the curve are precisely the same. This is the definition of an integral curve. The field direction matches the mo movement direction of the curve. Here's another example, the field f of xy equals xy, with all vectors pointing out from the origin and growing in magnitude away from the origin. Here are the integral curves of this field. They are rays out from the origin whose outward direction of movement matches the outward pointing arrows of the field. These outward pointing rays have definition gamma of t equals a e to the t plus b e to the t, where a b defines some direction of the ray. Again, Take the derivative. The derivatives here are just the same functions due to the exponentials. Then evaluate the field on the curve, replacing x with a e to the t and y with b e to the t, and then compare. The derivative of the curve is exactly the same as the field evaluated along the curve. These curves go straight outward from the origin, which was obvious from the diagram. What wasn't obvious from the diagram is the rate of movement. The speed of these curves grows exponentially to match the growing tangent vectors of the field. 
Integral curves are a really insightful way to understand the behavior of a vector field. Where do all these vectors point? What paths fit these vectors? Therefore, I would like to be able to calculate the integral curves of a vector field. This turns out to be a pretty difficult problem in general. I'm going to give you the main idea, but we're not going to be able to do the solutions in general. However, I will talk about some specific examples that we can understand to demonstrate the general idea. The definition of a parametric curve is a curve gamma such that the derivative is equal to the function evaluated along the curve, that definition of an integral curve, that is. In this context, f is known, but gamma is unknown. How do I calculate gamma? Well, I can expand this in components. Both the curve and the field have multiple outputs, and I'll do this in R3. The components of the tangent of the curve are the derivatives of gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3, the components of the curve. The components of the vector field are usually written f1, f2, and f3. This first equation is therefore actually three equations, as I've written here. Now I have three equations and three unknowns, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3. Each of these is a single variable function in the variable t. This is a system of differential equations. Three equations, three unknown functions, all in the same variable. Now you can see why this problem is so difficult in general. Differential equations are already difficult enough, but a system of them is particularly challenging. Since calculating an integral curve is equivalent to solving a system of DEs, it is usually unapproachable given the skills we, usually, we already have in this course. However, if the setup of the system is decent, this actually can be done. Here is the three-dimensional version of the two-dimensional field I showed earlier, a field where all the vectors are pointing outwards. The first three lines here are the system of differential equations that I wrote down in general in the last slide. Usually there is interaction between the three equations. However, in this particular example, gamma 1 only shows up in the first, gamma 2 only shows up in the second, and gamma 3 only shows up in the third. So these are actually three independent differential equations, which is much more approachable. And these are also differential equations I know how to approach. This is the basic equation for percentage growth. The derivative is equal to the original, and this is solved by the exponential function. e to the t is the unique function whose derivative is equal to itself. As with all differential equations, there is some initial condition. For percentage growth, it is the starting value a coefficient in front of the exponential. Therefore, the solutions are gamma 1 is a e to the t, gamma 2 is b e to the t, and gamma 3 is c e to the t for some constants a, b, and c. And this explains why the outward growth is exponential. The differential equation implied by the field is solved by exponential growth. Finally, here's one last example. Here, the system of DEs is still interconnected, but it is, it is approachable in sequence. If the field is f of x, y, z equals 1, 2x, 3y, I translate this into the differential equation for the integral curves. I get that gamma 1 prime is equal to 1, gamma 2 prime is equal to negative 2, or equal to 2 gamma 1, and gamma 3 prime is equal to 3 gamma 2. This is approachable because I can solve the first DE then use that for the second, and then use that for the third. To solve the first DE, I just integrate. The integral of 1 is t plus a constant a, so gamma 1 is t plus a. Then I look at the second DE. Again, I can integrate both sides to get gamma 2 on the left. Gamma 1 is inside the integral on the right, but now that I know gamma 1, I can replace it and integrate, and the result is that gamma 2 is a quadratic, t squared plus 2at plus 2b, with b some new unknown constant. For the third equation, I do the same. I integrate both sides and replace gamma 2 with what I just calculated to get a cubic for gamma 3. Well, then I know the curve. This gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 fit together to make the parametric curve that is the integral curve to this field. In this way, for certain fields with nice setups, I can actually calculate integral curves. And this is some prog progress, even if the general problem remains out of reach.